a bloodbath tonight in the rural town of Shinnom. Everyone here is hiding a secret. Four more victims found scattered. Some worse than others. I came as fast as I could. I'm Deputy Ruth Vogel. And soon, my quiet life will never be the same. Realm presents a 30 Ninjas production. Chinook. Starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, I'm Alison Larkin, writer, comedian, narrator, and host of The Jane Austen Podcast. Join me as we embark on a journey through Austen's timeless stories, starting with Pride and Prejudice. The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Serial. And I'm Umberto. And we're the hosts of So You Think You Can Rule Persia. A podcast where we rate and review all the kings of Persia from Diokis to Yazdegerd III. If you've been enjoying Anne's look into the cool women of history, join us for a look at the rulers of Persia and all their weird and wonderful glory. We'll be discussing their lives and myths before ranking them all and deciding who is really worthy of the title of King of Kings. And don't worry, there are some kick-ass queens all along the way. We hope to have you along for the ride. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster and our international season, which seems to be never ending. And I don't, I don't mind. I just keep finding stories to talk about. And this story actually kind of found me. So today we're going to be talking about Marguerite Steinheil, who was a French woman, an accused murderer and the subject of a new book that's just come out called The Red Widow, The Scandal That Shook Paris and The Woman Behind It All. It was written by Sarah Horowitz, who is joining me for this podcast. So Sarah is a professor of history at W&L University in Virginia, where she is also head of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program. She has a PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley, and has published in scholarly journals as well as the Washington Post. The Red Widow is her second book. And it's very readable. It's kind of like right at the intersection of like scandalous women's history and true crime. And we talk a bit in this conversation, like she's very much leading the story. She is telling me the story of Marguerite Steinheil and all of the twists and turns. But um, we get into sort of how I found out about her and her book. And I super recommend the book. And I hope you enjoy this conversation of a historical figure that of all the historical figures we've talked about in vulgar history is definitely one that I had never heard of before. And I'm so grateful to Sarah Horowitz for joining me to talk about this. Okay, so welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster, and I'm joined today by Sarah Horowitz. Welcome, Hi, Sarah. I'm so thrilled to be on your show. I want to tell you first, I should have told you this before I started recording, but um, I came across like a few months ago, just like a thing saying, like, oh, this book is coming out. And I had written it down. I'm like, oh, when this book is published, you know, read this because this might be a good podcast episode for me. And then your publicist contacted me to be like, Hey, do you want to talk about this book? I'm like, even better. Like (laughs) instead of me, like reading the book and like recapping it, like what about the book's author? Well, I'm so thrilled to be on your show. She does seem to like fit with the sort of, you know, scandalous ladies of your theme. And also I really, really uh, the like lesser known, you know, yes. Yes. But people who were like a big splash in their era and then just like five minutes later no one knew about them anymore right exactly yeah yeah so my first question like we're going to talk about the story of Mm -hmm. this woman but first like how on earth did you come across her yeah so about 10 years ago I was on a tour of Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris with some friends and as we were going past the tomb of Félix Faure who's president of France in the 1890s our tour guide kind of had to mention that Faure had died um, of a stroke he had while he was having an assignation with his mistress and then said that about a batch of years later, the mistress's husband and mother had ended up murdered. And the the tour guide strongly implied that she had had something to do with the murders. Uh, And I was like, this is not true. This is so improbable. This is an urban legend. It's kind of the thing that like the French people like to talk about. 
you know, their politicians and their politicians' love lives. And then I started reading about the mistress, whose name is Marguerite Sanao. And it was like, oh, no, he's right. And the story is so much more bananas um, than he had been able to say in, you know, the two-minute description. Uh Then I just got kept getting more and more invested in the story. And I went into the archives and it was just, it felt like falling into a gold mine because even what's been published about her, and there have been a few books about her, um, it, primarily in France, but also some written in English, um, they, you know, didn't really look into the archives and just missed this wild treasure trove of information about her and about the murders. I want to say now just fully, so the title of your book, so the title is The Red Widow, and then the subtitle says it all. So the scandal that shook Paris and the woman behind it all. Yep, that's her. Very yeah. scandalous. <laughs> so Marguerite, so you like you got access. Do you read French? I'm assuming. I do. Yes. And 19th, late 19th, early 20th century handwriting is not that uh, hard to figure out. Hmm. And also some of the archival sources are typewritten. Um, right. I think like early uses of typewriter, which is wonderful. They're so easy to read. That's perfect. Yeah. So like put us in a place in time. Like what, mm-hmm. when was she born? Like, I'm just assuming, you know, all these facts off the top of your head, but like, if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. She was born in 1869 in um, Beaucourt, which is a town in Eastern France. It's an industrial town that was at the time really dominated by the firm Jeppy um, brothers, which they were kind of, it was a metalworking firm. And she was from that family. So she, was, she was from the Jeppy family. Um, but her father was sort of the black sheep of the family and got kicked out of the family business for all his wild shenanigans, including marrying a woman of a much humbler background. And so she's uh, lives there for her adolescence. Um, she marries a Parisian artist uh, named Adolphe Steinel, um, or Steinel in 1890. Yes, sorry, trying to give. Um, and she goes to live with him. And she lives in Paris basically from 1890 to 1909. And this, this sort of almost two decades where she just has this wildly scandalous life in Paris, you know, making her way into Parisian high society through sex work. And she is, when she arrives in Paris, she figures out that her husband, Adolf, is a huge disappointment for many reasons. He's not very ambitious. Uh, he's very kind of resigned to be the, being essentially a mediocre artist. And he also has affairs with both men and women, which she's not super fond of. And he's much older than her, too. Um, And so she decides that she's going to stay married with him because divorce was very scandalous. But what she's going to do to make some money and find a place for herself is to start having affairs with prominent men. That was less scandalous than divorce? Yes. Isn't that wild? Yes. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) The problem with divorce is that there's no no no-fault divorce at the time. So that means that um, the family would have had to air its dirty laundry in public, which would have essentially meant to air um, her husband's affairs with men. Um, And she has evidence for it and she considers it. um, But affairs are something you can keep quiet, right? Or you can keep it sort of confined within the world of like a Parisian elite in her case. And so what I was really interested in is there's this Parisian elite. They have enormous amounts of political power, economic power, prestige. And one of the their sort of, you know, reasons why they say, like, we have all this, you know, right to be at the top of society is we're much better behaved than those poor people. Mm. Right. But in practice, they're all sleeping with one another. Yeah. Right. And so um, they, to negotiate that tension, they have to always like maintain this facade of propriety and kind of keep their sexual shenanigans somewhat hidden. Um, and so she fits into this world because divorce is public. Mm-hmm. So right, right, that's okay. super, right? That's super scandalous. But like just having affairs with tons and tons of prominent men, you can keep that quiet. 
And so she starts having affairs with these prominent men. Um, her first lover is actually her husband's best friend, which is a great way to get back at him. Yeah. Um, and he's a prominent uh, sort of, he was a very prominent jurist. He was essentially like attorney general. And uh, then she starts having other affairs, particularly with like important officials, politicians, industrialists, financiers. We think some like kind of, you know, members of various European royal families who are visiting Paris to enjoy its many pleasures. Um, And what she does is she um, doesn't want to directly engage in exchanges of sex for money because that would be to be sort of like, like one of the poor people. And so she basically makes a deal with her lovers that if they buy one of her husband's paintings, she will have an affair with them. That's perfect. So I was just going to ask you, I'm like, what's in this for her besides just like the fun of like having affairs? But yeah, so yeah. it's like, there's a financial benefit to this. She's not just like, I'm just like going to have sex with people because I like to. Yeah. Okay. And that way too, she gets to boost her husband's prestige. She's right. trying to kind of make him into a society artist. Mm-hmm. Right. No if one... these important people have the paintings by your husband, then he becomes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. No one actually wants his paintings. They're not great paintings, but she's like super charming, super charismatic, very seductive. So they all end up buying his paintings um, to have an affair with her. I'm and just like, sorry, I'm just picking up my copy of your book because I'm just like, what did she look like? Like she was very beautiful as well. I think so. What's really interesting to me is she's beautiful, but she's not sort of conventionally attractive by the standards of her day. Um, she has a somewhat fuller figure than the kind of wasp waisted sort of beauties who are like on postcards. But I think that's part of the attraction is that you, I think it's like a MILF thing, hmm. um, right? That you're sort of getting this like bourgeois grand dame um, who sort of, you know, dresses more respectably right. than other sex workers. But underneath it all is this like roiling current of sexuality. Yeah. Okay. No, that, and that's yeah. also an interesting level to it as well. Like that she, it speaks to her charisma and her seductiveness yes. that she wasn't yes. like the typical. Yes. 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 And she, apparently her voice was the thing that drew mm. people in. Which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This is a super seductive voice. She's also very good at reading a room. And so um, her kind of biggest conquest is uh, the president of France. Was he the Felix president Trump. at the time? Yes. Okay. So yes. it's not like she yes. like hooked up with him and then he became, oh no. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. He's president. They meet while she's on vacation in the Alps um, in 1897. He falls in love with her. She's sort of like, meh, I don't really care. Yeah. Um, but I love the prestige. Yeah. <laughs> and she becomes this kind of political broker. Like, you know, if you want a better position in the French government, if you want a promotion, you ha- go through her. Mm. She, she gets a lot of relatives, better positions. Wait, so she's um, like the mistress, but it's like a la the mistress of Louis the Fourteenth. Like it becomes, mm-hmm. it's not just like she's the person he's sleeping with. She like gets like this yeah. political power because he cares for her so much. She's able to yeah. like. Yeah. Like, okay. Okay. Yeah. I actually think a lot of people at the time really compare to one of the kind of royal mistresses of the old regime. Right, the kind of like Madame de Pompadours, these like very important kind of political brokers. You wouldn't necessarily approach the king directly, but you would go through the mistress because she's more accessible. And you go through the mistress rather than through the wife because the mistress is probably more amenable to that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. And is presumed to have more sway because she can always tell her lover, like, I won't have sex with you. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So then uh, he dies of he has a stroke in 1899 and basically he has the stroke while they're you know doing their thing in the Elysee Palace which is like the French equivalent of the White House uh and then like the legend is that she is performing oral sex on him I don't know if that's true that's just the kind of rumor that circulates around in um, Paris and the legend also is that he was gripping her hair so tightly that his aides had to come in and cut her hair, which sounds awful if that's true. Yeah. 
I just um, saw, sorry, total sidebar. Yeah. I don't know how widespread this is, but the algorithm showed me this like video of a show. I don't know what it is. It's like a Judge Judy type show where it was like a mistress and then the wife and they were talking. It was literally like that the mistress was having like a modern day person. Yeah. Who's having sex with the husband when the husband had a heart attack and died. Um, but the I'm oh I won't get into all the details. Anyway, I was just like I read that at the same time I was reading a, like your book, and I'm just like, oh, mm-hmm. this is just a thing. It's like if someone's gonna die during sex, like it's gonna be not with your wife. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. What happens? Yeah, yeah. And then I think she goes on to blackmail his widow. I'm sure. Okay, this is the <laughs> thing. Like, just everything you've said, like we're it's gonna get wilder, listeners. Yeah. Just know. But like, she is like an ambitious person who takes like every opportunity to like find an angle for herself. Yeah. Like she's just like a top notch grifter opportunist. Yes. I have no doubt that she tried to blackmail somebody as soon as he died. She's just like, how can I turn this to my advantage? Like, yes, this is who we're talking about. Like, she's yes. just like, let's do it. Yes. I, I think she's sort of like a modern day Anna Delvey or Elizabeth Holmes and that she's had so much ambition. She has so much hustle. She is, can't really stop lying and she's not really using her talents for the best purposes Mm -hmm. um but yeah she's really like she's always trying to figure out the angle but also like them too those are two great examples because like both of them like you're you're so persuasive that you're able to get very wealthy people to trust you and believe you while you are this like like james bond level like scheming person yes yeah yeah yes but you're also a woman. So they're like, oh, well, we wouldn't think the worst of you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so she, after Foral dies, I think she maybe blackmails um, his widow. At some point, she has a, an affair with one of her cousins to get back at her family, who she hates. Um, yeah. So that's a thing that happens. And she is also like notoriously a bad friend. Um, and all her female friends really hate her. And one of them becomes convinced that Marguerite tried to poison her. It's not actually the case, but if you could imagine that you have a fight with one of your friends, um, and then you're like, well, she must be trying to poison me. Like that says a lot about <laughs> who you are and who your friend is. Yeah. If, if your mind leaps right to that, like that, even if right. that's not true, the fact that you could think that just kind of speaks right. to yeah, exactly what yeah. you said. It's like, yeah. what is this relationship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, by 1908, she's really searching for an exit from her marriage. She's strongly considering divorcing her husband. He doesn't want to get a divorce, though. She's sort of in search of a lover who will marry her. But she Um, wants to, like, square that away before she divorces him. Like, she wants to have that, like, rebound prepared. I think so. I think she yeah. kind of wants to know where she's going. Yeah. She, it's, um, like, it's like you don't leave your job till you have the new job lined up sort of exactly, thing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And on May 31st, 1908, um, the valet of the household, like he wakes up early in the morning. He goes downstairs and he finds Adolf, the husband, and also Marguerite's mother, murdered dead of apparent strangulation and marguerite tied to a bed crying out for help and she you know, as you know he the valet like opens the door calls for the police the police rush in um they start investigating these murders and marguerite is the only witness and so she says that um, the a redheaded women and three robed men broke into the house, intended to rob it. They had thought that the house would be empty, but once they find that the owners are there, they decide to murder the husband and mother, but spare her um, because they think that she's the Adolf and uh, Marguerite's adolescent daughter. Ooh, and she's how old? Uh, Marguerite is, let's see, she is 39. Okay, so that's just like, I see some issues with this narrative. Yes, yes, there are some issues with this narrative. It's also, there are no signs of a break-in, there are no signs of struggle, 
on anyone's bodies. Um, there are valuables left in plain sight. Um, the house is like more or less in order. Like there's some kind of cabinets um, and drawers that have been rifled through. Um, and it there's a cord around her husband's neck to make it seem like he'd been strangled with a rope. But in fact, the autopsy shows he was strangled with someone's bare hands. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And there's a cane by his side to make it seem like he had tried to fight off an attacker. But, um, like, again, there are no signs of struggle on his body. Other than there there are these two very light bruises on his arms. Okay, I'm going to stop you here just to ask a quick question, which is, like, how good are detectives in France? at this time because I read a lot of murder mystery novels I watch Law and Order I'm just like "Mm, mm, here's some issues but I'm like but would they have thought of those things then or was it so badly staged even like the 1900s police are like "Ugh, this is clearly suspicious so that is a great question the public and the press are like this is suspicious this does not make any sense she has to be lying but the police and the authorities are like oh uh, she was more or less telling the truth and we're going to try and catch these dastardly, right? Like this is red haired woman and the robed men, like, right. The robed men, very inconspicuous also, people. Yeah. Yes. Also wearing like hats, like sombreros. So that does not make sense. Yeah. Um, and you know, so I think it's not that the police are incredibly dumb. It's that she had a lot of sway. Oh, all of her lovers. All of her lovers, including perhaps the chief investigator into the double murders. Okay. That's, you know, it's, I was like, why wouldn't she think ahead these details? And I'm like, Mm. she didn't have to. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. So there are two theories. There's like one theory that she did it. um, And there's another theory that it was actually one of her extremely powerful lovers um, who goes over the house for an assignation and um, he and Marguerite end up fighting. Um, And then, like, the sort of, in the midst of this, the husband is murdered. And and the mother was also strangled with hands? Uh, This is, so this is, like, totally weird. Yeah. Um, Like, the president's like, why was the mother there? Did she live with them, just in general? No, she was visiting. Okay. Yeah. So she was just, like, visiting at the time. And the daughter was staying at the, basically, Adolf and Margaret's country house. um, Because they were going to go to the country house. But the mother had, like, come in, I think, the day before, and she had done all these errands um, with Marguerite, and then they decide not to go to the country house because the mother has arthritis, and that's acting up. So they're going to, like, basically stay over there overnight and then go and reunite with the daughter in the country house. Okay, I know you're going to get to this, but just like as the questions occur to me, I want to mm-hmm. ask, which is like, what would be the motivation to kill the mother? Just that she saw, she happened to be there because of the arthritis and she saw, like this is the night that Marguerite was going to kill the husband, allegedly, and the mother was a witness, so she just had to kill her. Like, was there any animosity or? No, okay. there's, well, I mean, I think, so Margaret, I think, is often disappointed with her mother. Um, her mother has a very complicated life. Wait, it's her mother? It's her mother. Oh, I thought it was his mother. No, 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 it's her oh, mother. It's her mother. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's her mother. I think that Marguerite really loves her mother and is actually very protective of her mother. And her mother has a very complicated life. So her father, who's from this very wealthy family. Right, and the mother was like, like not so rich. Yeah. Right, exactly. So at 26 years, um, when her father is 26, he is staying at an inn um, and falls in love, quote unquote, with the 14-year-old daughter of the innkeepers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then two years later, um, he marries her. Is he, wait, but he's not already married? No. Wait, oh, that's not. the mother. Wait. That's the mother. That's the mother was the 14-year-old daughter of the innkeepers. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And... I think there's also a lot of evidence that he physically abused her. And so, you know, I think we could kind of understand that she's like really not able in certain ways to like fully be an adult um, because her husband doesn't allow that. 
And so Marguerite is often disappointed at how kind of childlike her mother is. Mm -hmm. Um, We could understand like her mother did not have a sort of real childhood in certain respects. So the, there are a lot of people, including myself, who don't actually think that Marguerite was the perpetrator. Um, There is, however, some evidence that the mother's death was accidental Um, And basically what the police say at the time is that um, someone stuffed a gag in the mother's mouth and the gag was stuffed in so forcefully that it pushed the mother's dentures back into her throat and suffocated her. Right. Horrible, horrible way to die. Yeah. Yeah. And not that there's a good way to die, but yeah. that sounds like a really... No, but even what you've told me, like, again, from my knowledge based on, like, Murder, She Wrote episode, mm-hmm. Law and Order, like, a woman doesn't kill by strangling with her hands. Yeah, and, you know, Adolf was a lot larger yeah. than she was. And if there's and... no str- signs of struggle, then, like... Right. Unless right. he was, like, I don't know, whatever, drug. But then it's, like, if he was drugged, then you just right. kill him by drugging. Anyway... Right. There's, I've got a lot of questions here, but like, yeah. this is again, read the book. <laughs> I, I also think, um, you know, like there were so many ways that she could have gotten rid of him that did not involve the sort of something that would have been so public, right? Yeah. I and mean, she could have just like slowly poisoned him. No, exactly. And I feel like she's like, you were saying, you know, like there's the thing where the friend was like, is she poisoning me? It's like, we know that she's like a crafty, clever person, yes. but she's doing all this stuff, like the affairs and everything. Like it's all in the right. shadows. Like it's all, yes. she's not out there in the public eye doing stuff. Yes. But this is like, it. Well, I, I guess just the inclusion of the, the family members. It's like giving me like Lizzie Borden, but France mm-hmm. sort of vibes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. So something's off about it. The fact that she's yes. there and still alive weird right and she is initially not accused of it right right and the again i think the chief investigator there's is some evidence that he's either like an admirer who's on his way to becoming a lover or um one of her lovers well, and well i would love sorry i i know that there has been like at least a tv yeah. show. I, was, I just had a vision where it's like, again, if this is murder, she wrote, like, she'd go over and she'd be like, wait, that that painting on the wall of your office, is that, wait a minute, because anyone with a painting basically is one of her lovers. So right. that's, that would be how I would do it. But Right. And there's also, you know, like, I think she's so well connected within the kind of French you know, government that, I, you know, I think there are a lot of people who very possibly would have pulled strings for her. And so what the authorities say after the murders is they're like, you know, we were trying to find the perpetrators. They were just common criminals. There's nothing. There's like men in robes and sombreros (laughs) walking down the street. Exactly. Like so many people are. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, you know, we're, we're hot on the trail. And then I think they essentially try and like bury the case, um, which you do. You just don't give any interviews to the press. Um, you just say there's no news, you know, unfortunately the investigation has come to a close. We haven't found the perpetrators, blah, blah, blah. The problem for Marguerite is that she really needs her name cleared because everyone thinks she did it or was lying about it or something. Um, and, you know, her lovers won't take her back until she mm. clears her name. And also like her high society friends are like, we're not super interested in being friends with you until, you know, you can prove that you're actually innocent. So she's like, I need to clear my name. And then she's like, okay, well, I'm going to start talking to the press. And she tells the press, she tells a journalist, like, the police are about to arrest some perpetrators. It's more or less as I, like, said, um, you know, there are these robed men. And, like, you know, so she's going to try and, like, show the world that she's innocent. And then the police are like, no, no, that's not the truth. Sorry. Um, and then she starts freaking out because she's, you know, now like, again, headline news after. Is this where she becomes known as the Red Widow? Like, so in a few, basically a few weeks after this. Okay. 
Yeah. So then well, she, she plants evidence on her valet. And then that's discovered. And then she's like, oh, it's actually the cook's son who did it. And I know I've known this all along. It's just that I really am so fond of my cook and I didn't want to make her feel bad that her son was the murderer. So that's why I haven't said this, which again is absurd. Yeah, yeah. Right, that makes no sense. And the cook's son also has a really, really strong alibi. This is the sort of story though. It's like you recounting it to me and like you would have read this in the records you were reading. It's like, this is absurd. But if you've got your like Anna Delvey level person seeing it and they're like, They've got their like magnetic personality, like mm-hmm. a person you'd be like, okay, like where it's like, you need to be, you have to have that charisma behind you to deliver this, to even attempt to make this work yeah. for you. Yeah. And without her here telling the story, I'm just like, well, of course that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so finally she, the, the authorities are like, we just can't handle you anymore. Right. And like, there's this huge public outcry. Um, because, you know, the police have arrested like these two uh, sort of working class men, the valet and then the cook's son. Oh, so they arrested. So she it. framed them, arrested them. And then they were like, oh, you're clearly not the killer. And then they. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So they finally um, her lover basically is like, I can't handle you anymore. And then arrest her and has her thrown into the Parisian woman's prison. Yeah. Yeah. So good. time, And that's when she becomes known as the Red Widow. And that's also when, like, all her secrets come pouring out in the press. um, And people are, like, endlessly talking about her last encounter with Faure and how he died. And, you know, I'm, like, reading these newspapers. And it's just, like, I am reading so much about the former president's anatomy. Like, it's just a lot to be reading that much about. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's the thing, like the subtitle of your book, like the scandal that shook Paris. So this Mm -hmm. was like, while this was happening, it's just like, this is it. Like, yeah. 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 It's like headline news. It just, it's actually in a lot of newspapers, it's like the entire front page. Um, Because people, and like, you know, you can imagine it's so exciting. Like this is this woman, you've kind of heard the gossip about her and then suddenly this case breaks open and like everyone's spilling their secrets and like her relatives are like trashing her to the press and her friends are trashing her to the press. And it's just like so juicy. And suddenly you get to like know all these high society secrets. So she she's in prison for a year um, and then she's eventually like put on trial for the murders. And, you know, had she actually been, like, found guilty and then, like, she could have been guillotined. Um, Guillotine still around? Because this is, like, 1900-something. 1909 at this point. And there's still, like, there's literally still guillotines. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It was the Parisian method. Well, it was the, sorry, French method of execution until they banned corporal, uh, capital punishment. Okay. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're, like, I think there was, like, a guillotine that was, like, last used in the 1970s okay yeah wild yeah right the like bloodiest method of yeah of execution so yeah that's that's basically sort of you know the nutshell the the like short version yeah yeah no that's like (laughs) certainly enough that we can absolutely score her on our yes in the four categories but also i think this is where it's like if that's that's the like nutshell version of it. It's like the book gets into um, kind of, there's so many questions that I want to ask, but of course it's like, that's what the book is for. Yeah. There's so many, there's so much stuff that, you know, I had to put in the book, couldn't put in here, gossip, more scandal. Yeah. And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. Tal mor, Sheshin Mughaki. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. 
At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know. Horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I am the host and creator of the podcast Only One in the Room. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. And we're back. So, sorry, I'm just bringing up my little document to remind myself of what all the categories are because I'm just going to leave this to you yeah <laughs> I love it expert okay so we're going to score her on our scandalicious scale the Fredigan Memorial scandalicious scale so the first category I explained this to you before just so you weren't yes. just like what are you talking about so it's four categories each is like from one till ten um ten being the highest and so the first one is scandaliciousness now mm-hmm. I know that this is gonna probably be her highest scoring category yeah but so it's not just like what um what a person did but also like the effect that like how people saw her at the time was she seen as a scandalous you know there's some like people where it's like oh this person had an affair or whatever but it's like yeah but everyone was having affairs so actually that wasn't really scandalous at the time but um yeah so on a scale of zero to ten <laughs> I feel she's definitely a ten I yeah. mean I think I think she kind of breaks the scale. Yeah. Um, what I love in particular about her is she's always trying to avoid a scandal. And then like in doing that, she just then creates a bigger scandal. Like, you know, she, in her early 20s, she could have divorced her husband. She's like, that's too scandalous. And so if she had divorced her husband and like remarried, we probably would have never heard of her. Exactly. But like, because she didn't want to divorce her husband to avoid that scandal, she winds mm-hmm. up with the president and then like this yeah. whole, he dies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah situation yeah. and then like you said with the with the weird murder thing she's like well, i need to clear my name mm-hmm. so i'm just gonna like frame some people give some mm-hmm. interviews which leads to her mm-hmm. right yeah yes and so yes. even though like you were saying like people at the time it's like it was common to have a mistress it was common to be having these sort of um situations but like you didn't talk about it and so the fact right. that she brought this all out in the open yeah. i know it it's a situation where I feel like a 10 could not be more appropriate. I, I, I'm a higher I, score. <laughs> yes. I think she is like the most scandalous woman of her day. And that's like saying something in kind of, you know, yeah. like early 20th century Paris. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Because when you're talking about like, you know, people having the affairs and whatever, I'm like, yeah, like, I don't know, whatever. Moulin Rouge the movie or whatever. It's just the Gilded Age. It's just like people were out there just like doing, st- like it was a wild mm-hmm. time. And the fact mm-hmm. that she was more wild than anyone. Okay. The next category is scheminess. And this is not just like, did this person have a crafty mind and come up with schemes, but like, were those good schemes? Did the schemes, <laughs> did, did that help them? I would say some of her schemes did. Yes. I think this is like, she's very crafty, but I think the schemes, some of her bigger schemes at least, do not work out so well. So I feel like this is like a five because like yeah. sheer craftiness, like 10, but then also like you got to take a lot off for the the fact that they really backfire on her. Yeah. Yeah. Just she's like, she's there. Like she's quick. Like whatever happened with like the murder situation, if someone did break in or whatever, the fact that she's just like, okay, how can I stage mm-hmm. this? It's like, that's schemey. But then mm-hmm. like your story was bad. Like mm-hmm. it's too many details. It's too mm-hmm. many weird details. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. So I think that tracks for me. So five for scheminess. 
So, and then the next one is significance, which is also like, it, it's really like case by case basis, but it's like, she was significant at the time. Mm-hmm. Certainly um, her legacy, I would say, I'm sure another scandal came a year later yes. and everyone in Paris is like, now we're obsessed with that. So it's not like yes. a long lasting legacy necessarily, but she was significant at the time. So like, how mm-hmm. would you balance that? So she, I think she has like really kind of two major like areas of significance one is she's like super significant at the time and then actually uh, um Falk's death really does change the course of french history That's, and okay like, so yeah if she was the one who was like <laughs> who was stimulating the president at the time that he died of effectively a heart attack then she is personally responsible to some level for like what happened yeah. next yeah so yeah, yeah. And it's um, at the time France is uh, like embroiled in what's called the Dreyfus Affair, which is this espionage scandal where there's um, a Jewish army captain who is falsely accused um, of espionage. He didn't do it. And it just whips up all this anti-Semitism. And um, Falk's death essentially allows like kind of France to move on from this. And it's what... Um, it's like basically, you know, Dreyfus is brought back to France from his horrible island prison, is put on trial and pardoned. And that really might not have happened um, if not for her intervention. We're getting it to the score, but yeah, is there a school of thought that she was some sort of paid agent and killed him on purpose? So um, there are. Were people at the time who thought that, particularly folks on the far right, sort of anti-Semitic nationalists, and were like, she was, you know, being like paid by the Jews. Problem with that is that she herself is super anti-Semitic and, you know, basically would not have wanted the the thing that happened. So, I mean, there's no evidence for it. I don't think she would, is like, that's a kind of, the idea that she was like, you know, uh, paid to do this is totally bonkers. Um, it's also would was just like not what she wanted. Yeah. No, I think it was in her best interest to continue being the mistress of right. the president. Right. Yes. Really. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. But so accidentally she has the yes. significance, yes. which which is significance nonetheless. Yes. So where would you score that on a zero to 10? I feel like that's a seven. Because of the effect on history, but also her significance at the right. time. Yeah. Based on all these newspaper articles and everything you were saying. like, yeah. And also, I would imagine that the ripple effect of these newspaper articles that are like, she did all this. So suddenly, like the effect of like, wait, you have one of her painting, the paintings. You've, it's just like, wait, these are who the lovers were. The, mm-hmm. Like, and how that would affect those people's careers and mm-hmm. their lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's so many people who are embarrassed because of you know they were like friends with her or one of her like lovers or something yeah Um, and yeah it actually like ends up sort of making the whole like french elite look really bad yeah 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 so certainly significant and then the fourth category i call it the sexism bonus Mm. so it's basically if you think about somebody who could have done a lot of stuff, but just wasn't able to because of like the patriarchy. So this is a mm-hmm. place where someone can get points where like maybe someone who didn't have a high significance score, but it's like, but you know, they really could have had mm-hmm. not the patriarchy. So everyone automatically gets a five because the patriarchy, but how much do you think sexism held her back? from achieving it's a her really, goals? It's such a great question. And it's a tough question in her case, because I think had she lived today, I think she would have had professional opportunities that she did not have at the time, which she may, she might've made use of instead of engaging in sex work. I also think that like, she probably would have just gotten divorced because divorce is not super scandalous. Yeah. If she was just like, my husband is kind of useless moving on. Right. Right. But the fact that she couldn't do that kind of led to this like string of weird things. Yes. But I think there's sort of like two things that count against her. So one thing I think that counts against her is she was like no feminist heroine. Um, I think she really like accepted a lot of the patriarchal norms of her day and was just like, I'm just going to make use of them. Like they benefit me. 
And that's like very mediated by like whiteness and her sort of prestige and position in high society. Um, and the fact that she's like can appeal to men in this very like uh, sort of, you know, she can sort of play on their sexual fantasies. The other thing that I think is like really interesting is there were times when the public really came to love her, like during her trial. And I think that, you know, had she been alive today, I think that sort of women in the public, I often experience tremendous amounts of abuse, um, but, you know, like on social media. And I think there was this way in which like, she was like, became the sort of national heroine. Again, I think that's like very mediated by the fact that she's rich and white and you know, like seductive and sort of plays to all these fantasies. But I think like there are certain ways in which she was treated better um, than she might have been treated today, which is super depressing. This is <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. But that's really yeah. interesting that people, so the public came to see her as a heroine just because like the way that I see these people, because she was so scandalous. Like they were just like, this is a great story. We're the, we're the people of France and we love it. I think so. I think they, um, I think the, she, she does very well at the trial. Like she's super funny. She's really smart. Mm, yeah. She gets the better of the, the, like, you know, like all the lawyers and the judge. Um, and I think that there's also a lot of like sympathy for her. Cause she's, you know, in prison for a year. It's not clear that she actually committed the crime. Um, but there's also, like, at the time, literally people make this argument that, like, well, she's pretty, so, you know, we should find her innocent. Yeah. No, that's that's very fascinating to me because I've just, just in my research for this podcast, like, there's so often where it's, like, people, whatever, if a woman is accused of something, they're just like, oh, she's terrible. She's obviously mm -hmm. terrible. But mm -hmm. but the people, I don't know. That's interesting. Because sometimes it's like, oh, we're sympathetic because she was abused and she like killed her abusive right. husband. Like sometimes I've seen that. Yeah. But this is more just like, she's just got such like charm. Like yeah. she's cool. She's pretty. Yeah. She's rich. Yeah. We stand. Super seductive, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that I like, I've just been sort of like, was so struck by that, that like there's a sort of adulation of her that I think is very hard for us to understand because we just assume she would have been vilified. Yeah. Um, yeah. But people are like, no, like, you know, she's she's like an icon. I love that for her. Right. What a weird twist. Yeah. So it's interesting. Like, okay, so I usually say like everyone gets five because just mm -hmm. like the patriarchy, but but the fact that she sort of like benefited from it, yeah. it's like I don't know if she even is a five. I don't know if five might be too much. I don't, I don't know. know. It's it's really hard. Like, I think there are ways in which her life would have like overall turned out better if she was living now, but I also think she kind of does okay for her yeah no she kind of like leaned into it and found a way to work for her so yeah. like you can absolutely choose a number lower than five like whatever you think is appropriate let's do let's say like four okay because it's there but she and there's been other people i've talked about on the podcast before too who are just like you know what it's like the picture kind of didn't get in the way if yeah. there's something where it's like well, her father supported her and then like her husband, whatever. It's just like it that kind of, she was okay because there were all these powerful men yeah. in her corner. Yeah. So let me just add this up. Um, so 17, it's a 26. Okay. It's 26 out of 40, which let me just take okay. a look. I keep a list of like who gets what's going. I'm going to see if there's anyone like notable who you might've heard of. <laughs> who else is it? Here's, here's what I'll say. Another person who gets a 26. Um, is a heroine of this podcast and also an accused murderer who is Frances Howard. Amazing. Yeah. So I think, and I think the story is similar in some ways of just sort of like a very seductive woman who gets sort mm -hmm. of caught up in this like murder plot where it's just like, did she do it? But there's enough mm -hmm. doubt about her. It's like the fact that you think that she could have mm -hmm. because of sort of what her reputation is, but then like utter, like such a scandal in her era and then like whatever forgotten yeah yes after yes. that yeah I love that I love that she's like in with like similar women no that's that's perfect and that's where it's like 
the four categories do try to tie like it's rare that somebody scores high in all four Mm -hmm. and those tend to be more people who are maybe a bit better known because they're especially to score high in significance so your book the red widow the scandal that shook paris and the woman behind it all can you just um i'm gonna put a picture of the cover and stuff on instagram but like at the top what's this a picture of these people who's that um, that's a picture from the, um, the trial. Although now in the like final cover, that picture has been taken out. So it's just her oh, it's in just red, her. Yeah. which I really love. I think it's like a super beautiful cover. Yeah. So it's like a picture of her just kind of like posing glamorously. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. So on the advanced reader copy, there's a picture of just kind of like some people, oldie times people just kind of sitting there at the trial. Like they're all watching yeah, I'm trying to let me um find my copy. So the in the advanced reader copy, the there's a woman um who's just to the right of the guards, and that's her. Oh, okay, I was wondering. Yeah, because yep. it's like a whole bunch of men, and then it's a woman. Okay. Yep. And then her lawyer is below. Um. Yeah. I like how just because I'm holding up the book, I like it's just it caught my eye the phrase a real life femme fatale, and it's like yes. This is yes. a story I could absolutely see being turned into like a 1940s film noir. Ooh. You know, of like a woman who's just like, oh, she's so charismatic and seductive. Yes. And then the next thing you know, you're murdering her husband for her. Yes. And then... yes, it's amazing. I mean, I think she would have been like an amazing sort of um, film noir, right? Like heroin, anti-heroin. Um, yes. Yeah. Her life is very cin- cinematic in certain respects. Definitely. And so I think what a gift to you as a biographer, that it's got this narrative arc to it. Mm -hmm. Like I could see if like all that she was known for was just the death of the president. It'd be like, wow, what a story. But it's like, but then, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I usually like other things I've written as a historian do not have this narrative arc. Um, But there's so many twists and turns in her life. I could only get to like scratch the surface in this podcast. You know, there are costumes, there's like weird coincidences, um, there's corrupt officials, there's like the whole, all of it. Um, And I think that made it like much easier to write in a way, but it also like more fun to write because you're like plot twist. Yeah. No, and that's what I love. The stories I choose for this podcast as well are just like when I'm, I find a possibility mm-hmm. like for her for instance if I just like look at the Wikipedia page just to be like well, let's just see an overview and when you see something that's called like the affair of the whatever I'm like mm-hmm. okay this is gonna be a saga <laughs> yep yep she's a she's a whole thing yeah no there's like yeah. her things I forget it's you know like early life like marriage mm-hmm. and then it's like the French president and it's like the affair what's it called it's just the Steinheil affair mm-hmm. Steinheil affair I think that's how it's pronounced embarrassingly I don't actually know how I've Ask French friends and they're like, we don't know how it would be pronounced. Um, it's an unusual last name for a French person. It is. So her husband's family is from Alsace originally, which is like Eastern France. So it has a lot of like German influences. So I think oh. that's where it came from. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Because yeah. that's her married last name. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. So do you want to like, like this whole episode has just been like a pitch for like why everybody needs to read your book. But like, do you have any other things you want to share about the book and why everybody should read your book? You know, like I will just say it was super fun to write. She's a wild woman. I love that she breaks all the rules in the book and gets away with it. She comes from an absolutely bananas family who they also were like, let's have affairs to get back at our other family members. You know, that seems to be like some sort of family pattern. Yeah. There's like poison, blackmail, funny costumes, outrageous lies, um, you know, like sort of people coming in and like dramatically shifting the plot, sudden revelations. And so I really hope people enjoy it. And that's the sort of thing where like, you know, sometimes you hear about people who are like, mm, I don't really like history. It's like, it's just stories mm-hmm. and like great stories like this one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look, I totally get it. If The book is not going to be for everyone, but I like, I think this is if you sort of liked, you know, Bridgerton, but like wanted there to be murder and everyone to be terrible. 
and there not to be any happy endings or alternatively liked you know inventing Anna and we're like but I want it set in olden times and there to be murder like this is the book do you remember um if you've watched Downton Abbey if you wish that Downton Abbey had gone harder on the like Lady Mary has sex with a Turkish guy and then he dies if you wish that the show had just become like Lady Mary yes and fatale instead of like everyone hushed it up and then they all moved on yes Yes. if like if Lady Mary then went really bad after that yes (laughs) Lady Mary breaking bad exactly yes no and it's also like history that reads like a novel like what's it called like popular history so it's not just like you know really esoteric with like whatever you know footnotes and it's just like no here's a story and like yeah, yeah and you tell it very like like a novel yeah I love that I mean, the other thing is, I think it's, like, also a work of true crime. Um, There are lots of works of true crime I love. But, like, the true crime, you know, has been, like, rightfully critiqued as a somewhat problematic genre because it often relies on the idea that the police are telling the truth. And we know that that's not true. And I think this is a really interesting example where, like, the police are clearly lying. And you can sort of see, like, that in her day, the function of the police were not necessarily to solve crimes, but to shore up the, like, a social hierarchy and protect elites and, like, punish poor people. Yeah. So, yeah. Example of that. I know, like, you've said so many things already that are just like, oh, it connects so much to, like, what's going on mm-hmm. nowadays. But it totally does. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Thank you. This has been such a pleasure. So again, the book that we're talking about here is The Red Widow, The Scandal That Shook Paris and the Woman Behind It All by Sarah Horowitz. You can learn more about the book, including find some extras and learn more about Sarah herself at sarahehorowitz.com. I'll put the link to that in the show notes as well. If you want to buy a copy of it, there's lots of links all over her website. If you buy a copy of the book, if you click through the link in these show notes to bookshop.org, then a little bit of money goes to support me and the Vulgar History Podcast. Speaking of such things, so we have um, ads on the show now. You might have noticed at the beginning and at the end. And then in the middle, there's a little ad break. And that is a new thing we're doing because this podcast is hitting the big time. And the more income I can make from this show, the more episodes of the show I'll be able to do. So I, I hope we can all get used to this change pretty quickly. If you prefer an ad free experience, that's part of what you get when you join my Patreon, which you can join at patreon.com slash Writer. So when you join there, you get early access to episodes of Vulgar History, as well as always ad-free experience there on the Patreon. And so that's if you pledge at least a dollar a month. If you pledge at least $2 a month, you get the ad-free experience and also you can help vote in polls. And if you pledge at least $5 a month, then you get access to the bonus podcasts I do. So most recently on Vulgar Peace Theater, where I'm joined with Alison Epstein and Lana Wood Johnson. We talked about Les Mis, uh, the 2012 movie, Les Miserables, starring Hugh Jackman and Russell Crowe, which got the lowest score we've ever given any film on that um, side podcast. Also, uh, for the $5 and up supporters on Patreon, you get every month or so I do an episode of So This Asshole. Uh, most recently, I did Louis the Fourteenth. Coming up in like a week or two, Christopher Columbus. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. And then also, um, you can keep up with me in the podcast at, on Instagram at vulgar history pod on Twitter at vulgar history, where apparently I just celebrated three years on Twitter with that Twitter handle, which means about three years ago in September of 2019, I decided to do a podcast. And one of the first things I did was reserve that Twitter account. So happy anniversary to me and Twitter. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can do that at vulgarhistorypod at gmail.com. Or you can also, there's a link on the website vulgarhistory.com where you can get in touch. Um, I'm always open to ideas of people who you think would be good episodes of this podcast. And I feel like I'm forgetting to say something. But maybe, oh yes, vulgarhistory.store. So if you go to our, if you want to get some merch, you know, holidays coming up, etc., vulgarhistory.store. You can use code TITSOUT for free US shipping or TITSOUT10 for 10% off of all the stuff there, including most recently added Empress Cece uh, Horse Girl Energy design is available there on various products. And so, yeah, 
I will talk to you all next time. Here we are in the fall, like how's it September? God knows. But anyway, I'm glad we're all here for the ride. These episodes just keep going. I honestly had thought I would be finished the season by now, but all the episodes keep being, you know, two, three or five parters and I'm happy to keep doing it. So anyway, keep your pants on, keep your tits out, and I'll talk to you all next time. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. We're the Ghost Story Guys. And every two weeks, we explore first-person stories of encounters with the paranormal from all around the world. Then we have some fun reacting to those stories. We like to say our goal is to scare the hell out of you, then make you laugh. Belief in the paranormal is not required. All you need is a love of great storytelling and curiosity about the world around you. Subscribe to the Ghost Story Guys now on your favorite podcatcher to hear episodes like High Strangeness in Chicago, The Mystery of Missing Time, and The Haunting of Vietnam, along with dozens of others. We've talked about mythical bridges, doppelgangers, haunted seaside towns, and so much more. Remember that story about the guy who was trapped inside a dream and something was hunting him? That was... that was upsetting. Yes. Yes, it was. Want us to help ruin your sleep? Come find the Ghost Story Guys on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else fine podcasts live, or at ghoststoryguys.com. Do you know what lies within nothing? No. Do you know where it ends? Do you want to know? Yes. <laughs> Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com.